Good afternoon, everyone. I want to say a warm welcome to everybody who is already here. At the same time, I also see the attendance numbers going up still. So I expect uh, in a couple of the next couple of minutes we'll see more people uh, joining us. But in the meantime, uh, let's make a maximum use of this uh, one hour lunchtime and uh, get started. Um, and I'm very glad that at least uh, we have a good number of people who signed up for this very interesting uh, talk from many different organizations and backgrounds. And I hope that this uh, will inspire a lots of debates and discussions also after uh, the talk and uh, online, but also uh, offline. I want to say a special welcome to Tom Fiske uh, for kindly accepting our invitation to talk about a very exciting topic, the metaverse and immersive technology. And uh, before I give the floor to Tom, I want to say a few words of introduction to this uh, DigiReal lunch talk uh, and the organizations behind it, because it's actually the first one in 2022 uh, that we're organizing and it's really good to uh, share a few uh, things on the background of it. It's got, not going to take more than five minutes, uh, after which Tom will have um, about 30 minutes, maybe a bit more, uh, to give his uh, talk. And then we use the remaining time for discussions and finding some actions. And we close sharply at uh, one o'clock. A quick introduction about myself and the team behind this uh, DigiReal lunch talk. Uh, I'm Igor Meyer, a professor of Playful Organizations and Learning Systems at the Academy for uh, AI, Games and Media at Breda University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And I'm also a professor at the Department of Organization and Management Studies in Tilburg University, the Netherlands. So good to mention maybe that my sidekick today is uh, Nick van Apeldoorn, uh, the program manager of DigiReal which you see on the slide uh, before. So he's going to help us out with uh, moderating the discussion and managing also the technical aspects of this uh, lunch talk. I should certainly mention that we're organizing this lunch talk uh, with several DigiReal partners. And uh, first of all, of course, Fontes University of Applied Sciences uh, in the Netherlands, um, in the presence also of uh, Professor Mark de Graaf, uh, my sparing partner at Fontes, and certainly also Mind Labs uh, in the presence of Petra van Dijk and her communication teams that is also helping us in organizing this lunch talk. So very briefly, what is DigiReal? Well, DigiReal is a two times four years sprong program uh, funded by an organization called Regie Organ SIA. And that is a special branch of the Dutch National Science Organization. And it's special because it mainly focuses on universities of applied sciences. And the objective of the Sprong program is actually to promote and strengthen the role and position that universities of applied sciences uh, can have in the wider R&D and innovation landscape, uh, especially in the Netherlands. So our objective is actually to build all kinds of collaboration with academic universities, industry, public and societal sectors. And for DigiReal, of course, the ambition is to do this on the topic of digital realities. With a special emphasis on, and you see a couple of examples here on virtual humans, digital social interaction, like we're having today in the metaverse, and a brand new development, which is called Digital Twins for understanding the complexity of society. We will explore this much further in the coming years, but uh, and we will do this by taking a lot of actions uh, ranging from academic research to field labs and technical seminars. And also, and this is the reason why we're here today uh, with talks, lunch talks like this. And we do this together with all kinds of partners in different sectors, uh, companies, societal and public organizations. And we will work closely with organizations like Mind Labs and Chronosphere and DigiShape and Logistics Community Brabant, who will provide us the content and the sectoral 
uh, knowledge uh, to use and explore digital realities. So this first talk is the first one in a series of uh, online DigiReal talks, but we will also organize uh, live seminars and events uh, in the coming months and years. And the next one I can already announce will be on digital twins for manufacturing, and there will be one on virtual humans. So, um, for instance, in a few weeks, in, uh, on the 7th of November, we will organize a live seminar, Metaverse Safari, where we invite people to really try out the Metaverse and to try all the technology, a really hands-on session. And we invite you to maybe contact also Nick and to see if you can, uh, can sign up. Of course, the places for a live event are more limited than we do online. Please follow us on the website, brand new uh, and still under development. And you have already seen that we are sending out a, a newsletter together with Mind Labs to keep you informed on all the activities that we are organizing. So this is enough for today. The key topic now is on the metaphors, uh, a topic that is widely talked about but few people seem to grasp what it is, uh, how it should be valued, uh, and if and how it's going to uh, impact business and society. So there are many questions, doubts, and even a lot of emotions around it. And I'm very, very glad that the speaker of today, Tom Fiske, is yeah, the expert to give us a little bit more insight on the topic and to maybe unravel a little bit of the questions that we already have and uh, maybe even provide uh, some answers. So Tom can also explain and, and introduce himself. I'm sure that you will maybe uh, take some time about that, but just to give you uh, a little bit of a start, he writes about immersive technologies at Immersive Wire, a newsletter and website dedicated to all things that have to do with VR, AR and the metaverse. And he speaks regularly at events and published a best-selling book, The Metaverse, a professional guide, an expert guide to virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, augmented reality and immersive technologies. So I invite you to listen, to share the questions in the chat, maybe even ideas for follow-up actions. And uh, we will come back to that in the discussion part with the help of our moderator, uh, Nick. And uh, Tom, enough for the introduction. Please take it away and uh, share with us your ideas on the metaverse. Thank you. And it's, uh, thank you for the kind introduction as well. Before I continue, um, do, does anyone see my screen? So does it just, just show what is the metaverse on the screen? Is it all clear? Is there any technical issues? It's all good. Excellent. So, yeah. Um, so let's begin. So I am, um, as beautifully illustrated on Tom Fisk on the Atelier Massive Wire. I've been writing about this since 2016, where I, in a VR headset, went into a first-person Pac-Man experience, where I was chased by ghosts in a maze, which made me think, oh, wow, there might be something to this. Um, got interested into this since then, been writing about it for many, many years, uh, published a couple of books, and then most recent is the one that mentioned. The nature of my role is I'm very broad with my focus and I tend to write all over the place in lots of different ways. I've written for Tech Informed about the marketing side, which is a lot of fluff, um, but there's a lot of interesting things happening there in the moment. I've written for The Economist when it comes to metaverse standards, because there's um, a lot of interesting things happening when it comes to standards across the metaverse, which is really important. I'm helping out the World Economic Forum at the moment because Again, they're having lots of discussions on the metaverse too and what to advise. I'm in the working groups based around more commerce and value creation. Last week, I moderated a talk on payments and commerce where there was a lot of discussions in the moment of what, what kind of currency we were using the metaverse to begin with. I'm personally very careful about crypto, but we'll get to that in just a moment. And because of my very top level view, and I talk to people who are far more clever than I, I have this very wide insights when it comes to the area and when it comes to development of immersive technologies and the metaverse. I find it to be a fascinating area and it's an area which is growing very quickly and changes all the time as well, which based on my own role is very difficult to keep up with. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting one. I write a newsletter in the space, I send once a week and I try 
to uh, basically analyze it each time. But yeah, there's a lot going on. What is the metaverse? <laughs> it's a key one. And it's one which um, is still under debate, partially because whenever someone uses the word, they mean it something different when they say it. Some people focus more on the enterprise side. They say, oh, it's about the enterprise metaverse. It's about digital twins and manufacturing, which I know there's a future talk on in relation to that. Other people say, oh, it's more social. We're talking more like, is it gamified experiences where it's social and we're all coming together to uh, socialize. And then still other people are just going, we, we already have the metaverse. In fact, we've had it with Second Life many years ago, or we've had it with World of Warcraft many years ago. Or RuneScape. I loved RuneScape when I was younger, but RuneScape can be a good example of that too. So, because of that, we don't really have a definition. And the reason why, and because there's a lot of debate on at the moment, the one I'm showing on my screen is one I just really quite like in the sense that it's an evolution of what we currently have. It's not accessing information like we have the internet, we're just accessing experiences. So, instead of Googling and saying uh, surfing experiences in Australia, uh, you search surfing experiences in Australia and you're in the experience and you feel it, as an example. Um, but of course, that requires a lot of innovations along the way, multi-decade experience. I'm going to touch on that in just a moment. I know there's also a definition from Matthew Ball. He wrote a, a book called The Metaverse, which was published earlier this year. Um, I know I've written a book on the metaverse, but I've got to be honest, I'm like a toddler compared to him. By his book. His book is called The Metaverse. It's by Matthew Ball best book you read on the topic and you'll learn a lot from it. So I really recommend it. And he wrote this wonderful definition on what the metaverse is. And it's one which is focusing more on the absolute most futuristic version of the metaverse. We're talking about the one which is gonna be happening a few decades time with new economic opportunities in ways which we cannot predict today. In much of the same way that I don't think anyone this call would have predicted YouTubers being a popular thing. I don't think anyone this call would have predicted NFTs to be a thing a few years ago. I think in much of the same way, there'll be new economic opportunities with this metaverse, which we cannot predict at the moment. We can make estimated guesses, but that's what we're discussing. And as I mentioned, it's still being defined. And I just want to distinguish between two separate types of metaverses as well. So, Micro metaverses is in relation to what we're seeing today. This is what we're talking about when it comes to VR chat, Fortnite, Decentraland. These are smaller ones which are not interoperable. They do not really communicate with each other. I admit that Decentraland is trying. I know they've got initiatives where they're trying to connect with one another. You can also argue that their web XR experiences are interoperable because they're based on internet protocols, but it's not really in depth enough. And the micro metaverse is where a lot of the more consumer applications can be at the moment. Whereas if you look at the macro metaverse, this is the one which Matthew Ball's defining as, that's where I'm more excited about. It's the most um, forward thinking uh, venture and initiation. What I would argue though is with most businesses at the moment, including the European ones, which is the discussion today, we're more focused on the micro metaverse side. Yes, there are discussions about interoperability, Keep an eye on that. Keep a cursory glance at the Metaverse Standards Forum, what's happening there. But for now, all the economic opportunities of today are going to be more micro metaverse examples. Uh, just a dip on the few. I've mentioned Fortnite, obviously, a huge example, which is explosive. And I don't, I feel like I don't need to go to further detail on that. Uh, Decentraland, as well, as mentioned, um, it is a micro metaverse example. Uh, I see lots of stats on how many people enter Decentraland. They oscillate between 300,000 unique visitors each month to 30 a day. Uh, if I'm honest, I need to double check on the stats on that because there's a, there seems to be a gulf between what people are saying, how many people visit Decentraland and how many people are actually genuinely interested in actually going there. So keep an eye on that. And then we've got Meta. Now Meta is a weird one because they are building the macro metaverse, but they also do their micro metaverse example called uh, Horizon Worlds. Same with Pico, actually, because they're building something called Pico World, which is coming out in 2023, which is another one to look out for. Uh, there's no macro metaverse examples because it doesn't exist yet. And if anyone says that the metaverse is here today, they're wrong, or they're, they're focusing on a definition which they themselves are thinking about but haven't really shared properly, is basically my assertion. 
So let's look at some stats. So that um, when it comes to stats in the metaverse, you can sell smarter meetings and you can also explore it. I've seen lots of stats when it comes to how much the metaverse is worth. Um, this figure on the slide is wrong, my apologies. It should be 13 trillion by 2030 according to City. Now the trouble here is there are companies who are providing all sorts of statistics. So we have uh, McKinsey who says it's a $5 trillion opportunity by 2030. Uh, we've got Frost and Sullivan, who said it was 750 billion by 2030. And we've got uh, one more, which escapes my mind, which is uh, roughly around 10 trillion, not this one, but a separate one. It's a wide berth. And the reason why it's wide is because we can't really quite predict what kind of economic opportunity is gonna open in the future. Because we're trying to throw darts on a dartboard, we can't quite see yet. We can't be certain what economic things will open up, but we can be reasonably certain they'll be more enterprise focused, there's going to be some really interesting things with content creators. Um, yes, there are artists working at NFT type stuff, and it's interesting to follow it from there. As I mentioned, it's unclear what the services could be. Retail and items are the safest bet at the moment, but that can change very quickly in 2023 and beyond. Yes, the creator economy is an area which I'm very excited by. I love the idea of artists exploring what they're doing and providing these beautiful experiences and beautiful artworks. Um, I listened to a great podcast that said that the world's first trillionaire is going to be a creator or artist in the metaverse. I disagree they'll be the first trillionaire, but I do think there's this beautiful opportunity where once we have more interoperable worlds coming together, these artists who build a reputation may well have this buy buying factor and they'll grow really quickly, which is a really exciting area which I want to follow. As I mentioned, it's a multi-decade process. It's not coming in the next few years. Uh, the technology is building it will come in the next few years, but I don't think there's going to be, it's gonna be here soon. The best way of describing it is um, the iPhone moment. Now the parallels aren't strong enough, but it's useful for parallels. I think everyone remembers when Steve Jobs unveiled the original iPhone and that kind of revamped and changed how phones worked from then onwards and the potential of phones. People refer to that iPhone moment as that moment, the opening ceremony. What it ignores is the multi-decades of um, technology that built up towards that phone. So again, the technologies for telecommunications, for texting, for image sharing, for saving, all of that confluence together to create this phone moment. And I have suspicion the metaverse will be the same where there'll be there's lots of good trends coming together. They may well be a single moment, but that single moment is very ill-defined. And I think just look at the trends rather than the singular moment. Um, and as I say, just keep an eye on our hardware. Yes, um, there are some headsets coming out. I know there are Apple. there's an Apple headset that might be unveiled or announced relatively soon. We'll have to see what it even is. So I don't want to speculate too much. I know Pico has um, unveiled their new headset, Pico 4, which is pretty good. I also know that Lenovo did the enterprise headset recently called the Think Reality VRX, which is also pretty good for the enterprise side. Um, I'm working with a company which is doing some very cool haptics, which is going to be announced in two weeks' time. So keep an eye out for that. The hardware side is really important. And what I've also found is the cost elasticity is the key factor. I found that, at least in the UK market, and may well be the case in Europe as well, these immersive technologies are price elastic, where the cheaper it is, the more likely it is to get buying power, regardless of quality, at least from a mainstream consumer perspective. So costs are important. I would keep a look at that as well. So let's touch on Europe and the metaverse, um, just to really go granular in our area. So there are no players in the um, Europe which are just like the US in the sense that we've got Meta, which is huge in the country, and we've also got um, Pico, which is growing in Asia and expanding into Europe, but there's no one of that scale which uh, exists within the European sphere at the moment, which we're going to touch on in just a moment. Yes, it, uh, as I mentioned, Pico is expanding quickly. Um, they are putting a lot of money into ensuring that they can uh, dominate into Europe, not the US, interestingly. So Pico is not expanding to the US, perhaps because Meta has a strong presence there or they want to build like a good base of operations in Europe. By the way, Pico is um, trying to grow really quickly in this area. Not to say there are like no companies. I know that there's um, Finland has Vario, which has some incredible headsets, which are doing very well from an enterprise perspective. 
I know Estonia has Ready Player Me, which I think everyone knows about, which is uh, basically uh, avatars, which you can operate in multiple different worlds, and it's got an interoperable context to it. And then there's lots of other companies in the UK which are doing extraordinarily well as well. Zappa is based in the UK, and they're doing some fantastic web AR-based experiences. Blipper is another good example of that as well. Um, but on the whole, but they're just like lower stage, and it um, comes down to funding. And there is a little bit of funding which is coming through at the moment. FFV Ventures is one example. Uh, I want to disclaim that I have worked with FFV Ventures, and there's someone which I help with from a content perspective, but they are doing some good work in the sense that they have a fund of millions just to invest within the kind of European um, context of the metaverse. And the funding is the thing, because there are a lot of early-stage startups that are looking to the area, and they, they just need additional support. And colleagues at FFU Ventures are exploring in that area. There is a talent problem in Europe. It's similar to the US, I would argue, in the sense that I think there's just certain skills that are, there's like a gap in. I'm not going to name the company, but there's one US-based company that's seen as like pioneering in creating metaverse experiences, but they only have, what, 50 developers in their team? It's not that many within a wider context, but because they have that team, they are seen as world leading in this particular area, which shows the scale of the talent problem. And I would argue also that there's retention, which is a problem as well, in the sense that you just need to make sure people can stay within um, the companies where they're in. We are going into a economically challenging environment at the moment where there's going to be a, a deeper type of recession and there's going to be a higher cost for businesses, which will be impacting um, people around the world. We've got to be cognizant of that. And there will be uh, talent problems in that sense, which is going to exasperate. But be careful. We need to, just keep, need to keep an eye on it and just support, support workers where we can. We've just discussed all the business context when it comes to the met, uh, metaverse. I just want to dip into policy. Uh, you may not know, but the European Commission's uh, head commissioner had announced that the metaverse is a key priority within their digital age initiative. All that basically means is from a policy perspective, the European Commission is keeping a close eye on the metaverse. A few months ago, the think tank of the European Commission released a fantastic paper which illustrates the problems they foresee or potential problems they foresee within the metaverse. If I have time, I'll um, share the link during questions. Uh, it's a great paper, which I recommend everyone in the school should read. But the crux of it is the European Commission is taking a close eye on it. And we may see some more regulatory movements coming up in the months to come, or maybe even next year, but we'll see. There's some debates about whether um, Europe has very stringent regulations. So there's always been, for many years, a long debate about why Europe does not have massive, massive players to the same scale as America. And it's a very complicated question. And I, anyone who tries to summarize it may be missing the point because it's so complex. There is a sub argument in relation to it. They may be linked to regulations where it might be a bit too tight. And it may well be that it creates a incentives for American companies to buy European companies um, just because they can't grow to a certain extent based on their environment. It's a sub-argument I heard, and I think this is something which the European Commission is looking into. And then one more element I would just want to touch on is the policy side, where I do not feel that the policy investments being made matches others around the world. So I know Spain, for example, are investing 4 million euros within a metaverse initiatives. I know the UK is looking to changes in policy to become like a crypto hub, for example. I know the, uh, the UK is not part of the e uh, EU, famously, but um, there is some parallels that are happening at the moment. Um, and I also, But that's very small amounts compared to what's happening in other countries. We've got Dubai, who's doing a proper initiative in uh, looking at billions at the moment, for example. We've got South Korea, who's got a massive area focusing on the metaverse, uh, for example, because they do see as the future what they're doing. Japan recently made some announcements about focusing more on Web3 and NFTs, and that was early this week, funnily enough. No money, granted, um, which is the base of my point, but it, it, there is an area they're looking further into because, as we all know, Japan is very technologically advanced in that particular area. My initial thought is I'm hoping within 2023 there'll be more support from governments. There is some support. I just think there needs to be more to be par have parity within Asia and America. 
because I think Europe is a little bit further behind at the moment when it comes to that area. So yeah, let's look at the new opportunities. So as part of this, there are some open opportunities because of research and what we can look at within Europe. I just want to touch on a few examples. I just want to be transparent at this stage. I'm no researcher. I, I research when it comes to articles per se, and I talk to many clever people about this area, but by no means am I like a university grade researcher who looks into the area. Um, there are a lot of interesting things comes to standards. As I mentioned, I wrote a piece on The Economist about it. This is the piece here. There, it, this was all about the Metaverse Standards Forum, which you may have heard about, where companies are coming together in order to set rules. It's an interesting um, group of companies in the sense that they're all Web2, you can say, where it's very traditional companies who wants to reach parity on what they can discuss on. I know there's um, discussions on file formats that may work with parity together. I know that XRSI is in there to make sure there's an ethical layer to it. It's just very early stages. And all it comes down to is consensus to make sure it all comes together. Very similar to what happened to the internet in the 1990s. And yeah, we'll just have to see if that comes through in that way. Uh, the, 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 we are living in a very volatile world at the moment. Just speaking on behalf of the UK, we didn't help ourselves with a mini budget, but uh, at the same time, there is some interesting financial things happening when it comes to Europe, which we just need to make sure we just control over, particularly in the cryptocurrency side. So I know there's greater scrutiny of stable coins, for example, uh, stable coins in the sense that it's a cryptocurrency based on a stable asset. So um, in one example, there could be a coin where there's parity with a one pound, for example. So one pound of stable coin linked to one pound, for example. There's greater scrutiny because yes, it is uh, more stable, but still got potential for volatility. It's all these regulations, all about protecting consumers. And this is important because I spoke at a conference, I think it was now like three months ago. It was a private wealth client conference. And I spoke to one lawyer who said that their client lost 350,000 pounds worth of assets due to hacking. And the, the problem with that is there's no protection at the moment comes to law. They had discussions with the law commission, but nothing set in stone quite yet. They made recommendations, nothing's in stone. And that's an area which people are looking at at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a new movement. I mentioned uh, stable coins. Uh, I look to cryptocurrencies, generally speaking. Uh, within the European context, I just want to keep an eye on what the EU is thinking about when it comes to crypto. I do think there needs to be some level of protection when it comes to people. If there's some level of protection, that does mean it goes away from the heart of decentralization to, to a more centralized body. Now, now, a lot of people might disagree with that because at the heart of crypto is to be as decentralized as possible for some people. I see it as a spectrum. I think that we're never going to be fully decentralized. I think it's just a question of how centralized we are going to be. And I think that's the main question to ask. Um, and yeah, so there's a debate on whether cryptocurrencies are even necessary. So when I was talking about um, the metaverse with the World Economic Forum, a topic came up where, yes, cryptocurrencies could be used for the metaverse, but at the heart of them, they should be a stable asset. You use a currency to spend it on other assets. You can't have a currency that fluctuates too wildly because it defeats the point of a currency. Uh, which is why I made an argument many years ago that the American dollar might be the preferred uh, currency of the metaverse, purely because it's so well supported. Uh, I was shot down very quickly, uh, but I think there's a strength to it in the fact that it comes down to trust and it comes down to stability. And I think cryptocurrencies at the current stage are just not quite good enough. Once they do, fine, they can be used, but I just don't think we're in that stage quite yet. Um, very quickly, I want to dip into some metaverse examples. So the, I'm going through these because I want to help potentially inspire research questions when it comes to areas of further investigation, or maybe areas from a European context you might want to follow through with as well. So these are kind of my favorite examples. And one less good example, which is important because we can learn from their mistakes. So let's go. Nikeverse. This is a Roblox experience where people can come in, they can like look some shoes. It's based on Roblox and it's done very well for itself. I mentioned here 7 million people visited. That's the numbers jumps to 21 million in the latest version. And that's not even been out for a year. So 21 million people have visited the Nikeverse. And this has worked very well financially for the company. 
Admittedly, they've not been transparent enough on how well their metaverse initiatives are contributing to their digital generally. But in general terms, Nike's uh, digital side is doing very, very well. I see a lot of money coming through in there as well. It works super well because it's so embodied and it all comes together with the company so well. It just encapsulates the brand so well and it works so well when it comes to payments as well. It's fully integrated. The other important factor is it's consistent. So this is not an experience which they launch and they're done with and they leave it and they go to the pub. They consistently support it. This is something which they've done throughout the entire year with new things happening and new reasons to go there. Consistency is so important for Metaverse experience. It can't be just like a run and jump. You have to just go. Another good one is Heineken. And this is a good one, not because it's good enough itself, but because it's more tongue in cheek. It was an anti-metaverse experience. They made, to use a British term, a piss take on what the metaverse is. Because what it is, is people come to the Decentraland, they come to this virtual brewery, and they made jokes about how like, wow, you can really taste this virtual beer. They really taste all the pixels. And they have um, all these people saying, there were all these mini games and we'll come virtual assets and the relationship types to it. They, and the core of the campaign, why they joked about the metaverse is because, oh, self-aware, that's really important. They joked about it because they just feel that real life is more important. They just want pe friends to come together in real life to drink a beer together. And they just made a joke about the metaverse because it seems like the antithesis of them as a company. Um, I spoke to the BBC about this myself. And um, basically the crux of it is because of that self-awareness, that meant that campaign got a lot further because they got a lot more attention and it provided a very powerful counter narrative. And the lesson for me, which I would say for you all, is that ownership of an idea and just going all in with an awareness of the public consciousness is so important. And I think that's why it works so well in this particular case too. Uh, let's talk about the less great example. So Samsung, what they did is alongside their phone example in February, they created a kind of location where they invited journalists and people to see a virtual version of their phone unveiling. So they did the actual version with their phone launch, they did the metaverse version. It did not do very well because Journalists, when they tried to go in, uh, there was technical issues where they couldn't quite go in properly and it was very convoluted and complicated. When they did go in, all it was was literally a YouTube stream of the phone unveiling. So we're talking like you're going to like a 3D virtual world to then watch a 2D stream of something which you could have watched on YouTube, basically. Um, it just missed, missed the mark and it got some PR backlash in relation to that as well. And it just told me that... Um, it told me a few things when it comes to this, uh, in that your metaverse experience really needs to like have a reason to exist. I know it sounds redundant, but a lot of companies, they are literally jumping in and they're on a bandwagon and they're not thinking through how it's actually doing something of value or adding value. I've, I've spoken to a cannabis company who wanted like a metaverse strategy, which I was like, no, you, you don't need one. Like you really don't need a strategy for this area. Um, and I just, just think this like, you just need to be very careful about why you're jumping this particular area in this particular way. You also got to think about frictionless experiences. Uh, I think everyone on the call would agree that the easier it is to access an experience, then the better it is and the more seamless it is and the more people will come in. That frictionless experience is so important. And I think just when it comes to design principles, that's important to consider as well. Uh, just to conclude everything, uh, I just hope this inspires further research. I think Europe is in such an interesting place at the moment because based on my own work with the Immersive Wire, I speak to so many companies who are doing a lot of incredible work in the area. They are always like small to mid-sized companies which are doing some fantastic things with brands or developing their own initiatives or uh, compiling their own technologies as well. And they're just making their way in the market. At the same time, the, there's a policy uh, side which is catching up very quickly and there's a lot of innovation in the space uh, and there's a lot of collaboration too. What I'm hoping is we've been throughout 2023, there will be some companies that will fold purely just because of a uh, poor pickup, but yeah, uh, we will see and we'll just uh, develop from there. Um, that's it, um, the, my presentation. This is a little QR code you can scan your phone to find my website. Otherwise I'll link it in the chat. 
but um, you can find me on the Immersive Wire. And yeah, I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Maybe if you can find the buttons, we can give a virtual uh, hand clap or something like that. I did see some discussions uh, starting already in the chat. And of course, we can go over the questions that were raised there, but it's also maybe nice to just have a, a live interaction, right? So, sure. uh, and I would certainly like to give the floor to uh, yeah one of the guests, maybe to ask one of the questions, maybe already posed in the chat, so that we can have uh, a live uh, social discussion also. Who wants to open with a one of the questions? I have a question, if I can. Of course, Fabio. Please, <laughs> fire up. Oh, I would okay. like to, to ask to make maximum use of the time. So short questions, pretty short answers, and maybe your follow-up question, if that is possible. OK, I would like to hear. OK. I would like to hear your opinion about the the central bank issued uh, cryptos. So, how do you see them in comparison to, let's say, the regular community backed crypto? Fantastic question. Um, as in to say, um, cryptocurrencies backed by central banks compared to cryptocurrencies that are not backed by central banks. Is that the question? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so personal view, and I'm, I need to preface this my personal view. The cryptocurrency that's backed by central bank will most likely seem better pick up than the cryptocurrency that is not. And that does come down to trust. You would trust a currency that is backed by a regulatory body much more than a currency that is not. You may have exceptions where there are cryptocurrencies that help facilitate certain types of trades, which you might want to continue. Ethereum might be a very good example of that. So I do see cryptocurrencies being used in niche ways for uh, niche circumstances in the future, for more mainstream appeal and for a wider metaverse. The currencies that are backed by banks or regulation will likely see the most pick up. Okay, Fabio, does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. I, I would have okay. several questions, but I would like oh, other yeah. let's see. Let's see if we can do quick rounds, right? To get the maximum uh, use of uh, Tom's in intellect. Okay, and somebody else, please go fire ahead. Don't be shy. I saw some common questions in the chat as well. Yeah, we can go over the chat. Of course, we can do that. Um, uh, Mark, please go ahead. <clears throat> Yes, I'll try to be brief. Um, it's the, the, the point VR versus AR. If you talk about frictionless experience, then AR I can see being frictionless. I wear these goggles all day because it makes sense and I can have this experience any time of day. But for VR, I always have to wear special goggles, uh, wear either clothes, device, whatever. So there is, there is a fundamental friction un uh, unavoidable. So what do you think uh, that says for the, the future developments? Are we going AR or VR? Great question. Um, there's two answers. The first answer is I agree with you that AR is more accessible. So if, especially if you're talking about web-based AR, if you're talking about web-based AR, there are 3.5 billion mobile phones that can run AR experiences. <clears throat> Compare that to the however million VR headsets out on the market. So of course, when it comes to access, AR is um, ahead. And I agree with you there. Um, my second answer is... Um, you, it may be the wrong question in the sense that it all comes down to what you're trying to build and what purpose you have with what you're building. Sometimes you you should use virtual reality because that statistically it is better for certain things. It is so good for VR training. It is so good for education. It is so good for simulations. Use virtual reality. It doesn't need to be the most accessible in the world. It depends on what you're building. Arguably for marketing, AR is better purely because more people can access it, for example. Okay, thank you. Next question, and see Marnix has a hand. Marnix, please. I wasn't the first, I think Nick was first and the others, but thank you for, for here. And, and Tom, good to see you, and thank you for the presentation and the, yeah, the, the so much knowledge and so much information, it's hard to choose where to ask a question about. But what I, of course, as, 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 as for research is, I have, I have maybe two questions. One is, is impossible to answer, but what do you see actually 
if you compare it maybe to other media or simulations, what is the key value now of, of the metaverse? Uh, if you compare it, for instance, to other social events or other things like what we're doing right now, what would you summarize it? And, and the other thing is in, in that, uh, and so you can choose which question you want to answer. What do you think is Europe, what, what, where should we focus on? You know, what should be our specialty compared to Asia or to the USA? Or what do you think is our focus on, on, on the agenda when it comes to the metaverse? Okay, so on the uh, current ways in the metaverse is being used, um, I think if you're a developer with Unity experience or C++ experience and you can build spatial things, you're in a very good position because you'll be able to create these virtual worlds and you'll be able to uh, deploy from there. I, did, I mean, the, where do I even begin in the metaverse? If you're including VR and AR when it comes to that area, there's already a very strong enterprise side, which is happening at the moment. There's always a very strong education side happening and other services. So those options are still there and still growing. On your other point of where Europe should focus, um, I mean, like, whatever your passion is, man. <laughs> it's just like, if, if, if you've got an idea and you want to go for it, just go for it. Like, you don't need to, maybe strategically, you want to focus particular areas of that idea, but, like, ultimately, you, sh you should really just follow what your passion is. Um, from a maybe more strategic point of view, uh, America's got this strong um, hardware base at the moment, and there's certain players, such as Pico, which are funded by uh, ByteDance, where they can, like, invest so much into the hardware side. So you could make an argument that hardware is more tricky than software, and you could argue that providing services in relation to the metaverse may be a stronger proposition than building a hardware for it because of capabilities. But even then, I may be wrong in that because you've got competitors like Vario, which is doing really well, for example, or VR Geneers based in Prague. I think the, this is a long-winded way of just saying just follow your passion and like don't let where your base stop you. It may stop maybe more difficult to hire certain things and other elements but if you're going to work for a few years on something just work on what you want basically well we tell students the same so now i feel like a student so thank you uh, but yeah. on that well, note on the glasses uh it's only do you think is there, is there a european glass like for open access do you know I, i'm sorry you just went quite for just a moment is open access to which part my apologies Sorry, is there is there a new glasses, new goggles coming up? Do you know that is is Europe planning for open access goggles, or should should we? Um, yep. So there's uh, rumors of that at the moment. Um, they're going to be clunky. I'd argue that you might want to um, keep an eye on it, but maybe not invest too much into it at the moment. There's a lot going on. Um, the original roadmap Meta had, which will probably has changed now, is they were going to release the AR glasses in 2024, then a new pen in 2026 then another pen in 2028. That was their original roadmap. The reason why that may well has changed now is because, um, as, as we all know, Meta is having some financial troubles at the moment, so it may well be that they've changed their pipeline since then. Um, there are other companies doing AR specs at the moment. You've seen Snap do it. So to Wave Optics, which were acquired by Snap, which is doing lots of cool stuff. Uh, there is the um, Views Explained, which is doing really well. Uh, I'd argue that the tech, tech is not quite there yet and the hardware is not quite there yet. I'd recommend just keeping a more wider glance across the space and just keeping an eye on AR glasses for now. Thank you. Koen, I see your hands. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, nice presentation, some nice examples as well. Um, I was curious on your take uh, on, let's say, the more active use of the metaverse. Your example showed, let's say, fairly business-minded and passive use. But I was curious to your take on the metaverse in relation to, let's say, sports or active entertainment. Huge area. Uh, so this is why Meta is focusing so much in it. And I have suspicion it's because you may have seen this, but Meta introduced, I think it was a year ago, a way for you within your oc Oculus headset, my apologies, your Meta headset, to basically do uh, recurring payments for that subscription model. And the crux of that is... It is lucrative because it's got some good margins when it comes to that. So there's uh, companies like FitXR who do like a subscription model, for example, which helps out with that, for example. There's also around it some hardware being worked on when it comes to the fitness side. Again, that's links to an announcement coming to Exciting, which is very exciting. Keep an eye out for that. It's related to haptics and fitness, which is very cool. So, yes, it is a vibrant area. It's an area which um, the bigger tech companies are focusing on because it's uh, a quite a lucrative area keep an eye on it, and I'd argue just see what happens with it. 
Yeah, I think uh, in terms uh, of software, I think there's a lot already available. I mentioned a platform like like Swift, which pretty much is already en route to uh, to go into this world. But I think the the main issue there is still in the hardware. That's still not suitable for let's say real exercise. Yes. So I mean, this again. I'm going to talk on my personal views, where I for five for one wouldn't want to sweat into a VR headset regularly and do a ton of exercise and then just have to clean the headset and all that stuff. I find that a bit of a faff, honestly. But I'm not the typical consumer, and I'm more of the target audience because there's plenty of studies and analysis that shows that one of the most popular areas of VR is fitness. There are people who do enjoy wearing a VR headset to do exercise, regardless of that particular area. Yes, the um, hardware is not quite good enough. I agree with you. I think there could be some more benefits to it. What I find remarkable is that despite the hardware, there is a really interested audience. And that's why I'm really interested in it. Okay. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I, I may have a question. So let's, let's assume uh, one of the attendants here, me as a case, I would run an organization somewhere here in the region, uh, middle size, uh, kind of can be in business, can be in societal uh, thing, maybe even a little bit in the public sector. Why should I be interested or care about the metaverse at this stage? If you work in the public sector? Yeah, I, I, let's say I'm, I'm a director or a manager or a CEO or an, a board member of an organization who works regionally or nationally at this moment, a middle-sized organization. Why should I be interested in the metaverse? So it's so interesting you uh, say that question because that, I, that comes to light studies I've read where there are business leaders, such as the one you described, who are interested in the metaverse from a, a hybrid work context. So in the sense that it's a more in-depth way for employees to be engaged and to come together and to socialize. The reason why I am so cautious about these studies is that they're nearly always commissioned by companies who provide the services for remote collaboration. So I am always very careful about those studies because there's a bias to them. But if we do take those studies with a grain of salt, if you're a business leader who wants to improve employee engagement, they are looking at the metaverse from a workplace engagement context in the near term. And if I read the studies correctly, these business leaders are also aware that this is not coming soon. They're looking to get at the moment, and it's something which they may well implement in the years to come, and they're keeping an eye on it on the board level, but they're not going to rapidly deploy quite yet unless it matches their current business strategy, which in most cases is not the case for most people. But if it is relevant, then yes, they would uh, deploy. I guess that's just a very roundabout way of saying that there is evidence to show that business leaders do care, but I'm very careful about the evidence. And I think the long and short of it is that just keeping an eye on it. Okay, any other questions? I see you, Nick has a question. Hi Tom, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, last year Mark Zuckerberg was number four richest man on earth, and now he's placed 22nd because he invested almost a hundred billion euros in the metaverse. What is his deeper vision with it? Like that is a lot of money, like how, yeah, what, what would justify this type of investment, you think? Uh, firstly, I just noticed that as soon as you said that, Zhao just did like a clap thing, which, which made me chuckle. But also, um, on the Mark Zuckerberg uh, investing a lot of money, got to bear in mind that the culture of these uh, tech giants is it's always day one for them. There's a wonderful book that is either out or coming out called Always Day One. And it's all about uh, how these massive tech companies always treat every single day as just like a new day. Then we'll look at the market and go, okay, we must adapt. Otherwise we're gonna have, we're gonna break. Um, Netflix does it all the time. Remember Netflix used to deliver DVDs over mail and they just kept changing who they were all the time just to adapt. Um, same goes for Amazon as well. Amazon kept changing what they were doing and improving what they were doing to adapt to the scenario. Uh, Meta's doing exactly the same. They've been seeing what's been happening with social media and when it comes to revenue generation, and they've been seeing that um, when it comes the next natural evolution of social connectivity is something more immersive and more spatial based, which is why they're putting a lot of money into the metaverse. Um, 
people saying that um, Mark Zuckerberg, oh, the, um, he's used to be one of the richest people in the world, goes down to 22. I mean, firstly, he's still like rich as hell, like his life is fine. Uh, but but the, the second point is, it's just investment into the future. Um, what, what they want to do is want to make sure that when the metaverse does come, which I believe is ine inevitable, uh, they are like a core part of it and a major player in it. So they're moving quickly and moving this particular way because strategically, they want to make sure that once that happens, they are strategically sound. And then if that plan works, obviously their, their shares will just go back up again. Longer term strategy, they have enough money to do this plan for a few years to come. We'll see how it goes. But by the way, I'm with my comments. I'm not saying that I'm endorsing the project. I'm not saying that I support what they're doing um, or not support, as it were. It's just uh, just a reflection on why they're doing it to begin with. Thank you, Gigi. You have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the nice talk. Uh, I'm wondering that uh, from the beginning that you said that um, metaverse, instead of providing information, that uh, give experience. That is. Uh, very nice. I play game myself, so I can understand that is fantastic. But if you look at the use of internet now, that it's not everybody is looking for experience. Actually, there are majority of people that using internet mainly just for searching information. That is why the searching engines are the most popular ones. Google. So uh, take this into uh, account. Do you then think that metaverse will ever be the upgrade internet for all the people for the for experiencing the internet instead of looking for information? That's a yes. fantastic question. Thank you. I hope that uh, is clear for you. No, it's no, it's a it's a really wonderful one. Um, it it also comes to light. I think we're making the assumption that the internet is everywhere. When, in, like, in a lot of parts of the world, um, there are people who don't access the internet regularly, or even can access the internet regularly. We're quite in a um, developed area of the world where internet access is almost a given, and in the U uh, and also human right as well. And the metaverse, I think, is going to be an even more niche part of that as well. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> I do think that there's going to be a case where accessing information by the internet will always be there. There's something so smooth and frictionless about picking up a supercomputer and just finding out whatever the hell you need without doing anything convoluted. Never gonna go away. I don't see it ever going away. As a more niche need, I also see a developing market, people wanting to access spatial experiences for whatever reason, to socialize with friends, to game, to go into simulations to train, to just try out holidays, to try out new things. It's a more niche need, potentially for entertainment, potentially for enterprise, but that need will also be there. I have, I'm going to be very transparent and say, I do not know if that is ever going to be as big as the frictionless access of information. I'm not confident to say that. What I am confident enough to say, though, is the metaverse area will probably be big enough to be an economic opportunity to be lucrative to make a living. I just don't think it'll be as big as the other one, but we'll have to see. Okay, thank you very much. I see a hand of Luca, Luca Simonetti. Please yes, go on. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, I can hear you. It's nice also to, to view you if you have a camera. Uh, uh, I would ask you to turn it on. If not, for some reason, then it's okay. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Hello. Um, yes, I had a question as well. First of all, thank you. It was very interesting. Um, my question is from an ethical perspective, do you think it's ethically permissible to even be? doing this and if yes then to what scale and where does it end or where should it end well that's well that's a big question uh, <laughs> um so if you're interested in the area um the people who know far better than i and are experts are called the xr safety initiative or others in xrsi so if you google xrsi what they're working on is incredible and i think you should take a look at their work because they're that's exactly what they're focusing on my perspective when it comes to that is 
of course there's an ethical dimension to this and of course it's developing in a particular way what i just suspect is going to happen is there's two groups of people they're the builders and the talkers and i'm going to be self-reflecting and say i'm i'm a talker who talk to builders all the time uh however much we talk about the ethics side of it which is important and how is going to be looking into it fact of the matter is there are builders out there who are building these immersive experiences who are um, trying to do x y and z and what's going to happen is they'll build it and then the ethical side will come in most likely um and we just got to be careful of that stage um the nuance to that is there are zero level blockchain layers which are making sure they are trying to be as permissible as possible there are companies which are trying to make sure that there is some level of restriction on the kind of data they follow with leaders at the moment which is good but equally there may be new problems that come up which we can never predict that's just the nature of technological development um so uh to answer your first part of the question um i'd say just build and then just iterate i know it's like not the most helpful um description but the, the fact of the matter is you need a foundation and then judge the foundation that's just the nature of building yes you can make sound decisions while building obviously but we're going there's going to be stuff that happens we can't predict and on your second part of the question how far we go and how far we go on ethics i mean baseline stuff is just don't track users a bit too much um make sure that there's a layer to make sure users are protected if there's any predators or there's any like danger um i do think also that this should be some level of like government intervention just to make sure people aren't dickheads in the metaverse just to be bland points on this um but ultimately how far we can go is very difficult to say at the moment because as i said the metaverse is still a bit undefined at the moment so i my recommendation is to take small steps take a uh, take analyze each step being taken and then make a judgment call on each one is my advice in that stage but i'm i'm so sorry for how convoluted that answer was but that's a huge question so i hope that's helpful uh, I think he's done uh, pretty you. well. I, we, I think we have time for, uh, thank you also, Luca, for the question. Uh, Petra, I see your hand, and that's maybe the closing question also, so you can end with a bang. But you have to unmute, otherwise it's not a bang. Hello, Tom, uh, from Eindhoven. Um, so, uh, gaming started off with uh, entertainment uh, purposes and ended up in using using it in seri for serious purposes. Mm. Are there metaverses with serious purposes as well, like uh, education or uh, immersive awareness about climate issues or things like that? Um, multiple answers. Uh, yes, there are platforms that are more focused on education. So you've got Engage platform, for example, which has got a lot of great stuff working on that. So Engage. I see you writing notes. So it's literally just all caps engage is what the one you want to look at. Um, you've also got platforms where within them they've got education elements. So if you go on your MetaQuest, they've got educational uh, documentaries and things as well. It's very easy to find them. So you can learn a lot from that as well if you wanted to. Okay. And also within the uh, App Store too. National Geographic is a great app on the Quest, for example. Um, and, and if you're going to go to more enterprise side, um, if you want to use the more loose definition of XR, yes, there are companies but it's more special as the enterprise metaverse. NVIDIA uh, unveiled, well, I could only describe as metaverse as a service where there's a more immersive way of just uh, using um, immersive technologies. I saw Marnix just sent a link to Engage VR if you want to take a look at it. And uh, NVIDIA is doing like immersive tech stuff too. Um, I think that's a big question. I think it's just a case of just the long and short of it is every, each platform has an educational element. You'll be surprised how much you can find if you just do like, a, I use Google as like, no, it's not Google, but you know what I mean, just search in the platform, you'll be able to find it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I think that we have to wrap up here. I would like to keep very strict to uh, the lunchtime hours, 12 to 1. Uh, but thank you again, Tom, for uh, giving this talk. I'm very happy also that we have plenty of time uh, to chat um, and to, to discuss this topic. Um, so thank you for that. Also for keeping your presentation uh, not condensed so that we won't have the time like that. Um, I'm sure there's pretty much a lot more questions uh, to answer. I would 
actually invite and encourage everyone that if you have any ideas on how to take this any further, if you have a special interest into this, then uh, contact, I'm sure, also you, Tom, uh, or Nick, or uh, the research groups uh, at DigiReal uh, to see how we can explore further. Um, and I do want to mention also that uh, we're planning to do a Metaverse Safari, and Marnix, among others, is in charge of that, where we actually want to try out stuff in a physical environment in the FNR in Eindhoven. And uh, we will inform you as soon as possible on uh, if and how you can attend that one. I'm looking forward to much more research uh, and meetings uh, like this on the metaverse and other uh, topics. Uh, we will have the next one on um, uh, Nick there, you need to help me on digital twins, I believe for manufacturing. Exactly, we're gonna have uh, a lunch meeting every first Thursday of the month and the upcoming one is going to be on the 3rd of November about digital twins, the next one about virtual humans. We will also cover volumetric capturing, if you are in education. So there are a lot of cool stuff is coming up. Uh, yeah, we'll keep you posted on it. Yeah, and if there is any ideas in the group on uh, how to take this further or how to maybe help us organize one, then uh, please contact us. Um, I'm happy with the first uh, kickoff of uh, this first Mensch talk. Uh, thank you very much again, um, and uh, we'll see each other soon. Yeah, I have one last remark. Uh, there, I posted the link in the chat, and there's a feedback link to it. So it's really short. It takes you less than 30 seconds, and it gives us an impression how to improve, how to get better, because we're researchers and want to know what else is going on. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm sure the discussion will continue. Speak soon. Bye-bye. Have a good day.